Major funding for Perfect Illusions, Eating Disorders in the Family is provided by the Don and Melissa Nielsen Family Fund. Additional funding is provided by the Janet Upjohn Stearns Charitable Trust and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. Hello, I'm Lauren Hutton. Each year, thousands of families learn their daughters are seriously ill in a life struggle with their minds as well as their bodies. Eating disorders like anorexia and bulimia are often overlooked, easily hidden and masked behind perfect illusions. Although it wasn't my particular problem, for many of my fellow models, it was, and they paid a terrible price. With treatment, most people with eating disorders will recover. Tragically, some will not. You're about to meet four young women and their families struggling with eating disorders that have dominated their lives, complicated by the trials of adolescence and the demands of society. Their courage will take you behind the stats, beyond the perfect illusions. I used to dream about food. I used to dream about, like, food chasing me. I used to dream about food eating me instead of me eating it. The night that I was kneeling by Maria's bed and thought that she had died, it doesn't get any harder than that. Don't pretend it's not happening. Don't pretend that your family is perfect. You are making this kid sicker. I felt a feeling suddenly cowering above, waiting to be recognized. A tense, burning fury, unstoppable, unwilling to step back. It rises and gains momentum, penetrating all the secrets in my body. She said, I knew that I might not survive, but the fear of gaining weight was much greater than anything else. You know the ultimate truth. There is no hiding from yourself. The difficulty of it lies in our society's ability to create perfect illusions. Anorexia and bulimia affect over 4 million people in the United States, most of them young women. If you had to describe them, you would probably say they were attractive, normal-looking girls, but they share a huge problem. They share a distorted image of their bodies and a distorted image of themselves as people. This is the story of four young women and their families and their struggles with eating disorders. At the age of 26, Maria Hornbacher finally feels she's in control of her life. For years, she was anorexic, severely limiting her food intake. Her 15-year ordeal and her recovery are chronicled in her book, Wasted. I was gonna be smart and I was gonna be thin. And smart and thin I was, um, it just didn't turn out quite as planned. Annie is a 20-year-old college student in Seattle. She's been bulimic for six years. She has a compulsion to overeat and in response, throw up, take laxatives, or exercise compulsively. She's also been anorexic. I'm not doing very well right now, to be perfectly honest, and I can't tell my mom that, you know? I can't, it just, she needs me so badly to be okay that I don't want to disappoint her. <laughs> and it just, um, I don't know, it's very hard. 16-year-old Suni is in the early stages of what may be a long and difficult fight with bulimia. It began when she was 14. I don't do it on purpose. It's not like I mean, I'm like, okay, I hate myself. I'm having such, I mean, I don't, there's not like those thoughts that go through my brain and I don't, I'm intentionally that I go and I'm like, okay, I'm gonna self-destruct now. I mean, it's just something that happens that my brain does and this eating disorder is so tricky and it's so overwhelming that it really, it's, it's deceiving, it lies. Those lies are about to cost her parents nearly $100,000. Anna Weston of Minneapolis fought anorexia. And because her battle ends differently, 
The only way we can hear her voice is to listen to the words in her diary. I feel very alone. I'm thinking about weight, eating, fat. I wonder when I'll be okay, and I keep thinking, never. Looking back, Maria Hornbacher sees a handful of turning points in her struggle. One of them came here at Low House, a locked treatment center in Minneapolis where Maria spent almost 12 months. She goes back for the first time in 10 years and reflects on the struggle Hi. she faced there. Good to see you again. Welcome. Happiness was so far from my mind. It would never have occurred to me that I would ever be happy. So I did this instead. I was gonna be smart and I was gonna be thin. I realized that I was gonna have to get completely better. This was my room. I'd give up dieting, give up obsessing about it, be normal. I was never gonna be one of those women who could hate their body. I was always gonna have to be a person who took care of myself. And I decided not to do it. I decided to get out. And I lied my way out and got sicker than I ever thought would be possible and nearly died. Eating disorders are very complex illnesses, very mysterious in many ways. Dr. Joel Jaris is the medical director of the Eating Disorders Unit at Methodist Hospital in Minneapolis. He points to a combination of interrelated factors, genetic predisposition, brain chemistry, cultural influences, a trauma or loss, and complex family dynamics. Their family illnesses, by and large, they impact much more than just the individual that struggles personally with the eating disorder. And so the uh, chaos and the dysfunction that develops in families surrounding this illness uh, can be devastating to families. Psychologist and author Dr. Pat Fallon has been treating eating disorders for 20 years. When I see families, I, I always ask, I'm always curious about what they think um, the eating disorders are expressing in the family. You know, what's the voice? What is it, what is it saying? What is it speaking? What is the anorexia, what is the anorexia or the bulimia saying about what's going on? Maria lives in Minneapolis. Growing up, her parents were in the theater, acting and directing. Like many with eating disorders, Maria felt the pressures, real or imagined, of impossibly high expectations from her parents. I grew up among intellectuals. I mean, both my parents are serious intellectuals and unbelievably smart people, and intimidatingly so. And I really wanted to be them. I really, really wanted to be my parents when I grew up. Maria felt she had to behave like an adult, even when she was very young. I was a cheerleader. I was the editor of the school newspaper. I was the alto star, obviously not the soprano star, of all the school musicals. I was in all the school plays. I was in soccer. I did all this stuff. Here is this brilliant young woman scoring off the charts on all kinds of tests. What could be wrong? Well, a lot. A lot is wrong. When I was growing up, for example, I wouldn't exactly say my parents pressured me, but it was so obvious that success was their premier goal in life, both of them. That of course, success was, and still is, to some you know, dangerous extent, my premier goal in life. That's probably not the healthiest thing in the world. Happiness used to be a really big one. Suni Eisenberg is a junior in high school in a town near Seattle. Suni shares some of the same struggles with eating disorders as Maria but her family life presents different challenges. Her mother's family is from India by way of South Africa. Her father is a retired radiologist who battles daily discomfort from a disability that has kept him in a wheelchair for nearly half his life. To Sunni, her problems seem minuscule compared to her father's. It's just hard for me to talk about. Even to this day, I, I can't. Knowing that he's accepted his life the way he is, living the way he does, must be so hard not to be able-bodied like the rest of us. 
At home, Suni's mother, Saras, is constantly in motion. She also keeps busy as a community volunteer. I wish my mom would just take time out of her day and just lay down, watch a movie. I've never seen her do that. Just watch a movie from beginning to end without having to do anything. Annie is now in college. During high school, her busy schedule and high grades made her appear to be the perfect picture of teenage success. There was really only one place where she felt she could take refuge, with her horse, Icy. She felt the pressure to be the normal one in a family that had other concerns. I'd say the number one rule in our house when I was growing up is don't be difficult. Um, it was kind of, you know, swallow your own needs and stuff and try to make life easier for everyone else. You're living in a family with a bunch of people and we all have to try to get along, which means that you're just gonna have to, you know, deal with some things. We were focusing on another child. Um, one of our other daughters had problems with depression and it became very acute at times and we were concerned and we were getting her help and trying to meet her needs the best that we could. Um, this is one of the reasons I think that we didn't notice when Annie started feeling depressed herself. With my mom, there was always this kind of sense of, um, am I enough, am I the right kind of person, and uh, am I doing the right thing, um, is this right, is this right, am I, am I the right kind of person, what am, you know, this kind of mommy, mommy, is this okay? Children with eating disorders sometimes feel they are the ones who have to hold the family together. They don't want to cause any more problems in a family that is already under pressure. Anna Weston may have had some of the same feelings. You could wake your slumbering existence as the sun recedes, feeling guilty and worthless, like you should have accomplished daily dreams. But instead, you slept in late. Each of these four young women felt the need to become something they weren't, to live up to their parents' expectations, to not be a burden, to fix the family and hold it together. Their needs would lead them down similar paths towards a coping mechanism that at first seemed to provide relief and escape. For many years, I could never go into my parents' house without immediately turning into the kitchen and starting to think about what to eat. Basic 80s kid, after school, latchkey kid, came in and sort of got my snack, sat down, turned on Three's Company, watched the tube for a little while, and ate and ate and ate and ate, which I always did after school. Eating my way into a totally sort of drugged stupor and then going to sleep. I don't know why I did it. I did it because I was bored. I, I did it because I didn't want to think. Why does anybody eat and eat and eat and eat? I didn't want to think. I didn't want to feel. You know, it's numbing. Maria began to hate herself for overeating. Then she heard about purging from friends at school and decided to try it. The first time I ever threw up, I, uh, I had been hating my body, hating my body and hating my body for years. And like since I was four or five um, was the first time I remember deciding that I was fat. Um, I uh, stopped watching TV, put down my bag of Fritos and just sort of in this drug stupor walked downstairs and pulled back my braids and threw up. And um, that started a very long cycle <laughs> where I would do that every day after school. And then I started doing that every day a couple of times after school. And then I started trying to stay home from school and doing that. And uh, I hated it. I absolutely hated the fact that I did it. It felt really disgusting. Suni also found release by throwing up. It was a way for me to feel numb. Like I just could take everything in, all of the day's stress, all the things, all the feelings I felt not knowing what they would be and just get rid of them all at once by throwing it up. Annie became bulimic, using vomiting as her release. She was also slipping into clinical depression. You just learn to depend on it more and more until pretty soon that's the way that you cope with everything. You're scared about something, you're um, 
you're angry, you're anxious, you, um, you're fearful, you're scared, I mean, any, anything, and, and you deal with it um, with your eating disorder, whatever eating disorder behavior you, you do. And it's a lot like an addiction, and it's a lot like alcoholism. You know, people use alcohol and drugs to numb themselves, to deal with things. Most people with eating disorders also have other psychological challenges, such as anxiety, substance abuse, depression, or obsessive compulsive disorder. For Maria, it went beyond binging and purging. She became anorexic and all but stopped eating. You start setting goals for yourself. I want to get down to 100, I want to get down to 90, I want to get down to 80, and it just gets lower and lower and lower. I remember looking at the scale and it said 63, and I went 50. All you know is that you don't feel bad anymore. You don't think about things that bother you anymore. In the beginning, it's, it's kind of freeing. It, it's relief. It, it seems to work in the beginning. It just doesn't in the end. What they needed to do was to move from seeing the bulimia as a solution to their personal problems, really beginning to see it as a problem in their everyday life. And so they needed to move from a denial of uh, what the eating disorder was doing to them to um, understanding and seeing that, that eating disorders really get in the way of having the kinds of personal relationships and the kind of life that um, they want to have. In a society which promotes the image of being thin, it's difficult for these women to reconcile the compliments they get for being thin with the inevitable condemnation they receive if anyone discovers how they got that way. When I was very thin, when I was, you know, at my lowest weight, I was, that was the weight where I was getting, like, stopped on the street and people would try to pick me up in coffee shops and, you know, I mean, things like that. I mean, and so it's, I mean, it's, and I was very unhealthy, I was very sick, but that, um, I got a lot of compliments when I was that thin. As the disorder progresses, individuals begin to feel defined by it and alone with it. I would wait until everybody else had gone home, and it was just kind of the janitor and maybe one last teacher. And so what I remember is always these echoing footsteps in the hallway and, um, and this sort of locked, uh, hollow bathroom sound and the incredible echo of throwing up in an empty bathroom, in an empty place, in an empty school. Um, that's about one of the most alone sounds I can imagine. <laughs> Eating disorders become the deepest, darkest secret that somebody could have. They rarely want to let somebody know about that unless they happen to have a friend who also has an eating disorder that they feel that they can trust and share that information with. But much of the time, it's a very deep, dark secret. I had the shower water running, and um, that's actually how I hit it all the time, is that would be something I would have the bath water running or the shower running, and that was how I covered up the sound. Annie managed to keep her eating disorder hidden from her mom and dad for four years. I, I was very surprised after a while that my parents didn't know. I mean, here I was, I was throwing up every single day in their house. <laughs> um, <laughs> and um, it, it did surprise me that they didn't know. Um, but that, I was very pleased with that. And I, I took extreme measures to hide it. It wasn't until Annie was 2,000 miles from home, a sophomore at college in Illinois, that her mother, Ginger, finally found out. Annie's sorority sister called from uh, the university out of town where she was going to school and said, I think your daughter has a, a serious problem. What? We said. <laughs> and she says, I think she's severely bulimic. And uh, I said, I don't think so, you know. And there was this silence and she said, well, no. She's talked to a, a, a friend here in the house and she's told her this has been a problem for her for four years. I said, what? Four years? <laughs> Unbelievable to me. My worst fear was that they would find out and I would, that I was not the person that I, they thought that I was and that I was much more flawed than they had ever expected. And, you know, they were going to have to deal with this and my mom was going to flip out and, oh dear, what would happen if they knew? And they found out. It's a shattering experience to suddenly have all of your memories over the past four or five years tarnished. I think that's adorable. To find out 
you weren't doing a good job at all. You were clueless to what was going on with this child. Maria also hid her condition from her parents. She began forcing herself to vomit when she was only nine years old. But her parents didn't learn of her problem until she was 14, when they went to visit her at boarding school. By that time, she was anorexic. When I saw her, I, I just about collapsed myself. And she was skeletally thin. Um, she had, she was very, very, very nervous and very wired and hyper. She had all this fuzz all over her face, all this stuff that happens from extreme anorexia, not like you started it last week, you know, where she had lost 25% or more of her body weight. I mean, so this is by definition a crisis. I got to the point where I really would, would have preferred to be dead and actually was praying nightly, can I just die in my sleep? I can't live with this anymore. The night that I was kneeling by Maria's bed and thought that she had died, I held onto her hand and I prayed and I begged. It doesn't get any harder than that. By the time Suni's parents discovered their daughter's behavior, her grades were dropping, she was becoming depressed, and her bulimia was getting worse. Well, we, we need to make a decision what to do. What's new so that this doesn't happen again? Suni finally agreed to be admitted to the only inpatient treatment center for eating disorders in Washington state. But when her parents called the center, they found it had closed down just days earlier. One winter night, a few weeks later, Suni stole a bottle of morphine tablets that her father took for his constant pain. Then she went downstairs to kiss him goodnight. And I was like, I love you, Dad. I'll always love you. Like giving him the signs, kind of like, y'all, goodbye. And, um, I took like 1,500 milligrams of his morphine. And my son came back to bed and he couldn't sleep, I couldn't sleep, and he kept saying, you know, this girl is very depressed. Can I go and check her if she's, t if she's overdosed on any medication, if she's going to go check? Saras went to her daughter's room. Suni was unconscious. All I know is her jaws were clenched tightly. She was tight. I had to pull my hands you know, pull her up just to try and get air through her. Paramedics arrived just in time. My eating disorder was out of control. I couldn't gain control back of my life. I couldn't, this was the end of the line. It was either, you know, utopia and things would get better right away or this was the way out. And I chose this was the way out. Despite her brush with death, Suni spent just a brief time in the hospital. Two weeks later, she went back to high school. And that night, she overdosed again. It's exactly two weeks later, overdosed. This time, she came to me, though. She came and she says, uh, I want you to take me to the hospital. And I said, why? She said, I overdosed. It was my, like, me saying, I need help, I need help now without actually saying the words. This was just my way of covering it up, acting, putting on a tough show, thinking I was all cool, but I really wasn't. Suni's cries for help were answered. She had been given another chance at life. For Anna Weston, the doubts may have run deeper. At the age of 17, she was questioning her very existence. We question our sanity, determine we've gone mad, and fall into the pit of spent life. What do I want? That is the most difficult question when really I have two very conflicting answers. One which will kill me, and at times this seems to be the most desirable. At 20, Anna's anorexia became so severe that her family physician warned that she could die if she wasn't hospitalized. She was sent to Methodist Hospital in Minneapolis. I'm scared to death about what's going on right now. I can't have any control over my own mind. As much as I know what I need to do, it's so hard to. My moods are very extreme. One minute I'll be depressed, then another, something will make me happy again.
Mario Hornbacher's parents had tried almost everything. Family doctors, school counselors, and local therapists. For them, there was only one option left. Full-time treatment in a locked institution. And it was a bleak March day. And I remember looking out the window at a bare tree with no leaves on it. And uh, we knew that this was kind of the last chance for her to turn around. I realized that they were talking about putting me in the mental institution for good, and that I really was that crazy, and that it wasn't a joke anymore, and that I wasn't just trying to become some, you know, tall, sleek woman. I was ghastly looking and sitting there huddled in my coat in a chair, rocking back and forth while all these people tried to decide where to put me. Jay and Judy took Maria to Low House, a place where teenagers with mental and emotional problems go when everything else fails. It was awful. It was awful to, um, it, my mom cried. That never happens. She never cries. We just didn't say a lot of words, just that we loved her and, and kept hugging her and she was crying and we were crying. Um, and then we left her there. You know, and they locked the door behind us as we left, and she couldn't get out. She was locked up. Um, I thought I was going to die. <laughs> so I was locked up in a, one of those rooms that has fluorescent buzzing lights, and there was, I didn't have any choice in any matter. This wasn't surreal anymore. This wasn't fantastical. This wasn't exciting, and nobody gave a damn if I was thin. Annie's family also sought professional help. During Annie's sophomore year, she left college and voluntarily sought inpatient treatment. It was the first place that we started dealing with family issues because it was the first time that my family knew and that um, it kind of jump-started that and talking about those kinds of things and um, it, was a, it was a good beginning. And we too felt optimistic, almost like having surgery, thinking, okay, this has plagued you for a long time, but now now you're getting all of this help. We're breaking the cycle of, um, you know, all of this screwy eating uh, habits and a whole month of nutritional meals and regular meals. And um, this is going to be just great. You go in and you, you think kind of, you just want some help with the, with the superficial stuff. You think maybe if you're a little bit happier, your eating disorder won't matter anymore, you know, or maybe, you know, you'll have just kind of a moderate eating disorder. You don't actually really expect to totally give it all up. Patients like Annie are offered psychotherapy, frequently combined with antidepressant drugs and nutritional counseling. Therapists work to help them understand their behavior. That's the first step on the road to recovery. Individual therapy is usually supplemented with family therapy. And then we discovered about the first few days that she was home that this isn't over with. <laughs> I don't know, I mean, that sounds so naive to believe that, people who have struggled with this for many, many years. Getting treatment, going into a residential treatment program is the beginning, it's not, it's not the end. They expect the person to come back from treatment or to go through treatment and emerge on the other side as the same person minus the eating disorder. But the nature of the eating disorder is that it's a coping mechanism and it masks a lot of things and it masks problems, it masks parts of that person that they don't like. Um, and you can expect that in the course of treatment there's going to be a lot of things that bubble to the surface. After SUNY's second suicide attempt, doctors advise their parents that she will require long-term treatment but there are no longer any inpatient options in the state of Washington. So they take SUNY to Idaho, to a private clinic where she's in treatment for almost three months. You know, I'm hoping now that if things are not fine and if she's not okay, that she can talk about it and it's gonna be okay for her to talk about it. This one says I love myself. It helps me get through the day if I'm not feeling well. Everyone else will love me for who I am and I can be accepted for who I am because I love me, that's all that matters. Suni insists she's ready to go home, but much has been left unresolved. Oh, mom, you know, that's your fault. 
No, get away from me. Back home in Seattle, Sarah suspects that the three months of expensive treatment have not had the desired outcome. Just a few days after returning home, Suni goes into the shower and makes herself throw up. You just start eating and throwing up again, and it's just like, oh, that was a waste. I'm a waste. <sighs> Look at me, I can't do anything. It kind of, it feels bad, it does. It feels really, it hurts. There's nothing worse than knowing that like your parents spent a lot of money trying to help you get better, and you just wasted all of it. This sense of guilt is not unusual. Therapists point out that recovery requires more than just willpower. Recent research points to the influence of genetics and brain chemistry, as well as the individual's history and family dynamics. I sincerely believe our family is no longer compatible. Another fight, something totally insignificant. One thing leads to the next and everyone is screaming. I thought I was going crazy. Then I realized it wasn't me. I didn't want to need anything from my mother. I felt like I was uh, sticky. And she, that's how she describes children, is that when they're tired, they get sticky. Um, I didn't want to be sticky. I didn't want to be needy. I didn't want to cry. I didn't want to irritate her. I didn't ever want to unsettle her calm. It seemed to me that children ought to be adults rather quickly and that they just ought to go along with you and do whatever you were doing and just sort of be, you know, part of the party. I wanted to be perfect because if I wasn't perfect or if I didn't seem perfect, if anybody found out that I was not, in fact, perfect, um, they would hate me, they would go away, and I needed them. What was I gonna be if I wasn't perfect? I was gonna be not good enough. I was gonna be mediocre. According to one therapist, Maria figured out that if she wanted to bring her parents together, all she had to do was get sick. And boy, was that hard news when we heard that. I think I got sick basically because I was tired. I was tired of it. I didn't want to be the okay one anymore. I thought, well, fine, I'll be the sick one. It'll all come true. Everything's going to hell now. You want everything to go to hell? Now it's going to hell. Here we go. You know, I'm tired of listening to you guys fight. Since family therapy, the Hornbackers are now able to see some behaviors that may have contributed to Maria's illness. At the time, they had no idea how their behavior was affecting their daughter's world. I've had people say astonishing things to me that said they would not take a look at their family dynamic. And I would say that unless you do that, you have absolutely no hope whatsoever of your child being able to get better. It was hard to sit in family therapy sessions and say, yes, yes, I am controlling. Uh, yes. I, I do try to control every cent that my family spends. Yes, all those things about me are true. Yeah, that's, that's hard. That by itself will not solve the problem, but it's a big part of the problem, and it has to be part of the, of the cure, of the therapy. It has to be. Annie is now in individual therapy. This has become a source of conflict. I'm pretty sure that my mom expected the focus of, of therapy and the focus of my treatment to be on me and me changing and me learning to live differently. I don't think she expected anyone to turn to her and be like, I think you need to make some changes. Um, I th she tends to look at it like it's my problem and my disorder and I'm the one that obviously is sick and I'm the one that obviously needs to change. My daughter's therapist handed her a book to read called The Narcissistic Family. It was a scathing attack on parents who were oblivious to their kids' emotional needs, basically. And I couldn't imagine why this was an appropriate book in this situation. Why don't you choose a conversation topic? Why don't you choose a conversation topic? Thank you. 
from that point on, she, she hated my, my therapist. She, she really hates her and um, never really misses a chance to tell me that. You know what, Annie? This tire looks really low. Next time you go to the gas station, you might check it. We were just at the place yesterday. Yet the way parents are treated in this disease yeah, really is like, let's kind of keep you at arm's hey, length. Haven't hey, you caused on. enough trouble already? Hey, hey. If my treatment really did take the direction that my mom wanted it to, I would just get worse. Um, and I know that. Anna Weston's father, Mark, felt trapped between trying to fix things and realizing the insidious nature of his daughter's illness. It was like, I really believed that somehow she could just decide not to do this anymore. And, I, and then I would realize later on that, I, that that was wrong and I, you know, that it was a disease. And I think it was, it was a, it's a hard disease to understand and it's a hard disease to not feel like this person, if they just have enough willpower and enough courage and enough something that they can just will themselves out of it. And it's not, it's not that type of a disease. Successful treatment for almost any eating disorder is a long, difficult process. The average recovery time is seven years. And for the family, it's a balancing act. They're part of the equation. But most realize that ultimately, it is the patient who has to do the work of recovery. Can you bring the hand down anymore? Whoa! The summer before her senior year, Suni is still losing weight. She doesn't know what to do. I mean, I'm trying to be a stronger person. I'm, but it's so hard, it really is. You just wanna break down and cry and just say, why can't it just leave and just go to someone else? I've had it for long enough. Desperate, her parents locate a treatment center in Arizona, Ramuda Ranch. But it will cost $83,000, none of it covered by insurance. I left a voicemail and then I called again and asked them to pay them. They said she was in a, she can't be interrupted. Just... Saris negotiates. They were really expensive. They were, um, instead of uh, $83,000, they said, they, you know, we must come up with $63,000 for two months. Suni is excited, but anxious she might fail. I might be going to Arizona, probably, um, to this place called Ramuda Ranch on Saturday. I think I will find out today. And I mean, part of me wants to go so that I can get better, but part of me is just like, oh, when you get back out, you'll probably just be the same mess. Five weeks after sending Suni to Ramuda Ranch, her family flies to Arizona to join her. They are about to spend a week in intensive family therapy sessions. Our daughter is there for the purpose of trying to heal, but the environment at home also has uh, some play in how she heals or doesn't heal. So we are going to try and learn uh, if there's anything we can do to make Sunni's adjustment back to reality easier. We've been talking to her, I guess, three times this week by telephone. Um, and uh, yeah, she's real anxious to see us, and we're certainly anxious to see her. And so is her sister. I know she's gained weight, so, you know, I'm looking forward, uh, you know, to just a well goal again. It's uh, difficult because you know they say that this is such a long process. Of the healing process is so long. It just you just don't get better in one month, two months, and all. Although Suni swears she's ready, you know she can come home now. Um, my husband and I don't think so. Suni's sister, 10-year-old Rashi, finds it difficult to understand her sister's struggle. I never really thought about why. I 
mean, I think she's real pretty, and I think she's, you know, she's accomplished so many things, and I don't know why she would, you know, want to do these things. I know she can get better if she wants to. It's just a matter if she wants to or not. After two days of family therapy, Saris is looking at herself and her family relationships differently. I was feeling nothing. I didn't know how to feel. When you look into your past, you see all these things that even I had locked up in a, in a box and I wasn't able to open up. Eventually, everything comes out, everything. Because only if you're true to yourself, then you know you can start to heal. I haven't been uh, the type of mom that Suni wanted. I was a distant mom. I was there for her for everything and to do everything for her and help her with everything, you know. But in communication, I didn't have the closeness with her. So you're going to learn that now. Until you do what you believe in, you don't know whether you believe in it or not. It was by Leo Tolstoy. After much soul searching, 60 days of treatment and over $60,000. Everyone hopes Suni is on the road to recovery. The day after she arrives home, she forces herself to vomit. Maybe, you know, I wasn't ready the way that my mom had said. So many things had gone through my mind. I was just, just so, I was scared. I had left an environment that was structured that I had been for so Long. I feel saddened, you know, if, especially when I find all the food gone. <laughs> and then because it's obvious, you know, she's not gaining weight. Let's put it that way. So it makes you, it makes you realize this girl is still binging and purging. If any of these women have been a drug addict or an alcoholic, her parents might have relied on their health insurance to pay for weeks or even months of treatment. Instead, they had to pay the entire cost of treatment themselves and the beginning of the beginning all over again. A fresh start. Smells fresh, tastes fresh, looks fresh and feels fresh. T-shirts, watermelon, and soda pop. Refreshing. In most states, insurance companies deny coverage for long-term inpatient care for eating disorders. Anna Weston's parents, Mark and Kitty, learned the hard way and the insurance company, who had never talked to Anna, had never seen her, didn't really know anything about her, said that it wasn't medically necessary, which is obscene. It, 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 it's, it makes me very, very angry. I'm in my own business, so I bought this insurance plan myself. I bought it because it was the best plan available, and I was horrified to find out to get into this problem. And, realized that they just wanted to wash their hands of it. They, and I had a disease they didn't want to even hear about. One of the things that um, Blue Cross Blue Shield told us is that they are happy to pay for treatment that's effective, but there isn't any effective treatment for eating disorders. So it's like, all right, so we send them home to die. My unhappiness continues on. There really is no way to rid myself of this, is there? And who is listening anyway? No one. My life is worthless right now. Saying goodbye to such an unfriendly place can't be as hard as believing in it every day. And essentially, my spirit has fled already. And she said it was the darkest moment of my life. She said, I didn't feel well. I knew that I might not survive. But the fear of gaining weight was much greater than anything else. Do you remember it? Did you, were you One of Anna's best summer? friends, Vanessa, who also fought anorexia, was living in Los Angeles when she heard Anna was back in the hospital in Minneapolis. Within a few hours, she was on a plane. As she walked into Anna's hospital room, she wasn't prepared for what she found. And she turned around and, like, I'm totally overwhelmed with joy to see, like, my girl again, you know, so I'm swelling up with tears from that. But then it also, at the same time, my heart is just totally broken <laughs> because she just didn't look at all like herself or how I'd ever remembered her. 
or seen her before. She looked sad and she looked like somebody else, like not my Annabelle. I mean, she had dropped a lot of weight in that four months and that just broke my heart because then I just knew that it had her like so bad. I might fall eventually. A restless coma I'll stay in for the brief moments before my pale moon lies down. Each star quickly falls from the scarlet sky. They sleep in piles of fallen leaves beneath cool water. Anna Weston finally succumbed to her illness. On February 17th, 2000, she took an overdose of painkillers. The Westons, still mourning the loss of their daughter, went to war against the insurance company that had denied her treatment. While the insurance company's denial didn't cause Anna's death, I think it contributed to it, and it certainly contributed to our stress level and our pain. Kitty and Mark helped spearhead a lawsuit against Blue Cross Blue Shield in Minnesota. In a landmark settlement reached in June 2001, the insurer agreed to pay the state $8.2 million for treating patients who had been denied coverage. It also agreed to establish an independent panel to review denial of mental health claims. The Westons were awarded $1 million, which they are using to create Minnesota's first residential treatment center for eating disorders. Well, I, I think I'll feel that all this time and this, this pain and the heartache is, has been somewhat justified. Uh, the loss of Anna, I would go back in a heartbeat if I could and have Anna back. And in fact, <laughs> there was times after she died that I was very angry with God and I'd said, you know what, I would have done this anyway. You could ask me, I would have been a good advocate. I, you know, I could have done this. I didn't need to lose Anna, but that wasn't to be. Stop spinning turning, looking back or side to side. No more feet stuck in the sand. We have pulled them out, and now they will move. Maria was continuing her battle at Low House. The counseling, the medication, the nutrition, the discipline, all very expensive. All had no effect on a teenager who seemed certain to die. Sullen, stubborn, and desperately ill, she refused every therapy including simple hugs. The hell of it was, I did need a hug, like desperately, constantly, I needed a hug. One day, another patient, a much younger boy with a different mental disorder, dared to approach the sullen Maria to give her a hug. This is no sort of religious epiphanic moment. This is just a 12-year-old boy with big glasses giving me a hug because I couldn't stand it. And I started crying and he patted my back and sort of went, it's okay, it's okay. You can have another one tomorrow if you want. <laughs> and uh, I don't know, I started getting better. We've seen how it happens, but no one can yet say exactly why it happens. But counselors agree that family support is a crucial element for success. Never bail. I mean, never, never, never bail, okay? Because you're the grown-ups, you have the resources, not necessarily money, but psychic and the resources of will and, and love to just pursue every single solitary thing that you can. And just because you've done one doesn't mean that there's not gonna be another worse crisis because there probably will. 
A decade has passed since Jay and Judy cradled their daughter on what was almost her deathbed. We all, yes, of course, want our children to be gorgeous, thin, beautiful, intelligent, all the stuff. But the best thing you can do is accept a child as that child is. Even harder, Jay had to admit to himself that Maria's fate was beyond his control. But at some point, you have to accept that feeling that you are powerless, that as far as curing or helping control the illness, you're pretty much powerless. That has to be the job of the sufferer. That's the only person who can do it. I made a decision that very few people make in this culture, which was to actually figure out what was wrong and fix it. I really had to go through a lot of hell to get better. What I probably will do is struggle with food every single day. And it's important for families in particular to know that. What's really wrong, what's really troubling them is so deeply buried that it's the process of unfolding it, you know, like taking off the layers of the end and just see what's on the inside. and. Um, that takes a while. If you take away the way that I think and the way that I deal with things and my eating disorder and my, de especially my depression, I don't know what's going to be there when you take all that away. I don't know what's underneath. And that, that, that prospect is extremely scary. I mean, you're taking away the only thing that I know. Maybe instead of worrying about what she eats, whether she's eating enough, um, whether she's gaining or losing weight, I need to worry about my relationship with her. I need to have better conversations. I need to really demonstrate that I care about her. Saras has joined a parent support group to try to help her daughter and herself and others who may be just awakening to the fact that their child has an eating disorder. From the time she was little, I, you know how you do with a little baby? She scratched their back. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm still scratching her back. But now all I'm scratching is bones. So. When I first started coming to the group, and I'm saying, like, what do I have to worry about? Here's my child's going to school. She's still all A's, and, you know, she's doing all this. And not to realize that a year later, all the grades were going to drop, the suicide, everything else, you know, everything. It just came crumbling in. I think about that, and I think that's why it's so important to go back to the group, because these other parents that want to just sit back or haven't, or haven't really diagnosed the kids or haven't got help for the kids, because if they don't get it, they're going to be in the same boat. It takes a lot of work by families that are willing to face some very tough issues. Opening up as a parent and saying, I'm willing to work with whatever I can do if I've impacted this in any way, or work with you to do exactly what you say can be most helpful to you, can be totally therapeutic in itself. And I've seen some very dramatic results from that happening that lead to good recovery. With time, toil, and treatment, Maria was able to overcome her illness and get better. Annie and Suni are still engaged in the battle to recover. Anna Weston never had that chance. There will never be a moment in which you are not you. Some may try to hide their existence away, pretending that they're someone they're not, but who is this act for? You know the ultimate truth. There is no hiding from yourself. The difficulty of it lies in our society's ability to create perfect illusions. We are learning more about the causes, treatments, and prevention of eating disorders. With effective treatment, most patients will recover. Exciting new research also points to a genetic component in the disease. But once an eating disorder takes hold, it can rob years from its victims, damaging their health and stealing their youth. Therefore, our first goal must be to prevent eating disorders altogether. 
we should all learn to recognize the signs and be ready to take effective action. We're grateful for the courage of women like those you have just met. Their willingness to share their stories reminds us there's always hope and the promise of happiness. Thank you. For more information on Perfect Illusions, including additional video clips of people featured in the program, go to pbs.org. To purchase a copy of Perfect Illusions for $19.95 plus shipping and handling, please call 1-800-937-5387 or write to the address on your screen. Major funding for Perfect Illusions, Eating Disorders in the Family is provided by the Don and Melissa Nielsen Family Fund. Additional funding is provided by the Janet Upjohn Stearns Charitable Trust and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. We are PBS. Local production of KCTS Connects is made possible in part by the members of KCTS and by... Seattle Public Utilities, thanking businesses and residents throughout the Puget Sound for their water conservation efforts. Working together, we can solve our regional water resource needs for now and the future. And by the Seattle Post-Intelligencer. I'm Enrique Cerna. This is a special edition of KCTS Connects. Tonight. I remember looking at the scale and it said 63 and I went 50. Eating Disorders and the Family. We look at the challenges, the treatment, the support, and the successes. Next on a special edition of KCTS Connects. Welcome to this special edition of KCTS Connects. Earlier tonight, KCTS presented the documentary Perfect Illusions, Eating Disorders and the Family. In this half hour, we'll follow up with some of the women profiled in that program to find out how they're doing now. In addition, we'll examine the challenges faced by families with loved ones struggling with eating disorders. And we'll look at treatment and support in dealing with this difficult disorder. It's been more than a year since KCTS began production of the documentary Perfect Illusions. Joining me now are two of the women profiled in the program. Annie lives here in the Seattle area. She's 21 and a student at the University of Washington. Maria Hornbacher currently lives in Minneapolis. She's written a book about her own experiences with eating disorders. The book is titled Wasted. Well, Annie, let me start with you. Uh, how are things going now? For my eating disorder, they're going a lot better. Um, Treatment is going well, but um, to be perfectly honest, it makes life is harder to deal with. How and, so? Um, I have I. For example, I mean, I'm not doing as well as school in school as I did in kind of the worst worser parts of my illness. Um, back when all I did was sleep and exercise and study, I was doing a lot better in school, and now. Um, I have a social life. I'm not as stressed out all the time. I do other things, and it means actually that my I'm doing worse in school. And um, I have emotions that are all over the place. I get angry. I can get irritated. I can get um, frustrated and annoyed, and and really happy and very excited. And I, it's just a far cry from being numb all the time and not really feeling anything. And so I have a lot more than I'm supposed to deal with. And so I feel like my Highs are higher and my lows are lower. But maybe is that a good thing if you were so numb before? Oh, it is a good thing. Because, but it's you know, you were going through so much. <laughs> oh, it's a very good thing. It just, um, 
it's, it's harder to deal with in many ways. Ongoing process in dealing with all of this? Because you still are dealing with it, aren't you? Mm -hmm. I would still classify myself as somebody with an eating disorder. Anorexic or bulimic? Both. Both. Pretty much. And depression? Yep, that too. Mm -hmm. So you still have, you're still working at it? Mm-hmm. And, and it gets easier and it gets better and you kind of gain momentum, but... You feel like you have made progress and oh, that yeah. you are on a road to maybe one day getting, getting yes. well? but I'm not there yet and I know that, so... That's mm -hmm. part of the challenge, isn't it? Mm-hmm. No doubt about it. Well, Maria, you have um, a similar situation in that you've experienced what Annie has gone through. Would you call yourself recovered? Yeah, I would call myself recovered. I never thought that I would use the word in the full past tense, recovered. I thought I would, you know, always stick with the sort of qualified recovering. Uh, I can't imagine what I'd be recovering from at this point. I mean, I'm, I'm fine. I don't, I don't show any of the signs of an eating disorder, and I don't have any of the preoccupations, actually. Um, my life issues like yours have gotten much more complex. Life is less comfortable in some ways because you feel it. Uh, but I don't function through food anymore or through diet or any of that stuff. And so in that sense, in no way would I meet any criteria for an eating disorder. And in that sense, I guess I would have to say that I'm recovered. Is it a good thing, though, as, as I mentioned to Annie, the fact that you're feeling again? Because uh, in the documentary, it was very clear that you both reached points and uh, all four of the women profiled where it seemed like you were numb. Absolutely, and I think that's the function of an eating disorder for a lot of people and for a certain extent of time is to become numb. Um, when you reach a certain nadir of numbness though, it's called despair and uh, <laughs> that doesn't feel like numbness anymore. It just feels horrific and then you have to climb your way back out and that whole process of climbing uh, is, that is a lifetime. That, is, that isn't just recovering from an eating disorder that's learning how to be a grown-up. It's learning to h how to be, in my case, a woman. In, it's learning how to be and, and live in, in the body you have, in the life that you have. And so feeling, while not comfortable, is certainly an improvement from any objective standards. I become a better person the better I get in my life. At least I'd like to think so. You wrote a book about your own experiences. Um, was that a cathartic experience? You know, that's my least favorite question. No. Um, well, excuse me. <laughs> no, no, it's all right. <laughs> no one told me that. <laughs> I'll answer. No, it, you know, it's my least favorite question only because somehow I can't explain why not. It was not a cathartic experience at all. It was really awful. Um, I was not at that point, and I, I think I, I best just be honest about this. I wrote the book when I was 21 years old. Um, I'm 27, and that's not a vast amount of time, but it's a significant period of a life. You know, you go from being just barely past your teens to nearly 30. And so there's, there's a huge difference in perspective that has happened for me even in the last year. And so writing that book when I was 21, I think gave it an immediacy um, that I like, but there's a lot of anger to it. Mm -hmm. And I still was much more in the disorder than I am now, um, even though I was doing very well at the time. <clears throat> it wasn't cathartic. It led me also right back into the behaviors. Um, I was too close to it, and uh, I'm glad I wrote it. I think it had, I think it had an important impact. But um, I'm really glad not to feel any need to write anything like it ever again. Annie, did you read her book? Yes, I did. I read it many, many times. What did it's you think? It's dog-eared, and there's a lot of underlying <laughs> passages. <laughs> um, that the title wasted. Uh, the, was that what you were like? No, I never got to that point. There you never was got totally emaciated. No. Anything which means that a lot of people would look at me and say that I don't look like I have an eating disorder and I never did. That was my first reaction when I watched the documentary and I said, like, oh, she looks so healthy and you know, blah, 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 and therefore it must not be a very serious eating disorder because you know, I didn't get like those really stick thin people, so I don't even count as having an eating disorder. And I, a lot of people have that reaction. Um, and and that's, that's something that maybe people need to understand. Yeah. You may not necessarily look like I think that most like people with eating case. disorders look more like me than 50, 60 I would agree pounds. with her a hundred percent. I mean, I think you very rarely can you see an eating disorder. I mean, it, it's it's very rare. And if you're looking for fifty-pound people, you're you're going to miss everything. And it 
We'll get, we'll get into this a little bit more because <laughs> yeah. you two became the masters of manipulation and secrecy, which uh, is something that happens very much. Also joining us for this conversation about eating disorders and the family are Dr. Pat Fallon, a psychologist and researcher who's been treating eating disorders here in Seattle for 20 years. Dr. Fallon is on the clinical faculty at the University of Washington, and she's also president-elect of the a Academy of Eating Disorders. Virginia Lowe is co-founder and coordinator of a parent support group called Friends and Family Northwest. Her daughter suffered from an eating disorder, and as I understand it, Virginia, she's recovered now? Hi. So you must be happy in that sense. Well, uh, let me ask you, uh, Dr. Fallon, and I won't call you Dr. Pat, because I know you don't like that, <laughs> and I don't want to have any trouble here. Okay. Um, well, Pat, uh, what they just said, the fact that, uh, what Annie just said, the fact that, that you know, there may be this image of what someone looks like with an eating disorder and the fact that, you know, there are young women that do get totally emaci emaciated. Um, even within the documentary Perfect Illusions, the, the young woman who committed suicide, Anna, did mm -hmm. get to that point. Mm -hmm. And her best friend, you know, talked about how it was so shocking to see her that way. But elaborate a little bit more on what a Annie said. I mean, uh, the person that might have an eating disorder, is, is there a typical profile? Well, I think there, um, one of the things about eating disorders is that there's such a, a range and a variety of both behaviors and, and the kind of women, and men as well, that, can, that um, can have eating disorders when we talk about women. Because it's not just <clears throat> women. It's not just women. But 90, it's mainly women. 90 to 95% are women, but they're also men that um, develop eating disorders. But I, I do think that this, this belief that we have that we can somehow see, if we look at somebody and we look hard enough, we'll be able to see that, that they have an eating disorder um, it is one of the things that probably means that parents oftentimes don't see what um, they need to be seeing with their kids. And, and sometimes you need to go beneath just what somebody looks like and think about what are the, the sorts of feelings they're projecting, what kind of uh, behaviors do they have, um, and look at a bigger picture of things. But no, uh, I mean, there aren't many 60-pound people walking around anyway um, that are over the age of 10. And, um, <laughs> and, and if they've gotten to the, that point, um, they have needed to be in the hospital and people have easily been able to identify them. So, you know, there's a whole range. People can have um, bulimia that are overweight and are heavy. They can be normal size um, and with anorexia, it's, it's sometimes it's very quick descent into low weight, but sometimes it's slow. And, um, Briefly, give me a description of the differences, mm -hmm. anorexia, bulimia. I, I think yeah. we've heard those terms a lot when we talk about eating disorders, but um, what is each one? What are the differences? And are they tied together at all? Uh, tied together, oh, I'll, I'll, I'll come back to the tied together piece of it, but bulimia is, is basically a disorder in which uh, people eat what they feel like is too much. Now, by some people's definition, it may be too much. Um, other people's, it may not be, but they eat what they feel like is too much, and then they make themselves throw up or they uh, compulsively exercise um, in order to get rid of those those calories. But is it like a binge eating? It's a, it's a binge eating, but for some people a binge may be eating a whole sandwich instead of a half a sandwich or eating a, some chips with, a, with their whole it. sandwich. It depends some. And for some people, it's, I mean, a, a lot of times on the media you'll see uh, it described as eating huge quantities of food. And that, while that's true for some people, that's not necessarily um, the experience of all people that when and they're anorexia. binging. Is it and anorexia is, is characterized by um, really a, a enormous restriction in terms of what they eat and, um, and um, a steadfast um, statement about their feeling or being fat even though you could line up a whole bunch of people that would say no, no, you're not, yeah. which often happens for anorexics. Everybody's trying to convince them that they're not really. Virginia not Lowe, your daughter in her situation, I mean, uh, both Annie and mm -hmm. Maria have talked mm -hmm. about uh, uh, gave us hints about the secrecy and you know people not knowing mm -hmm. and their own family not knowing. Uh, how old was your daughter when you found this out? It was the very beginning of her senior year, but I started suspecting it during the junior year, kind of along second semester. So there. she might have been sixteen, seventeen. Right, right. There. right. Okay. And and I knew so I knew something wasn't right, but I I honestly did not know what it was. It was one of her sisters that took me out and said, "Mom, I want to tell you what's the matter." What was she doing? Um, she was getting compulsive about everything, like I remember when she had to give a talk for her English class and she must have practiced it 30 times, 
and she, I knew that she, she knew it. And I said, what, what's going on? Why are you overdoing this so much? She started withdrawing from the family. She started hiding. Her eating habits started getting what families come in and say are weird and strange, <laughs> which means that they don't like to eat with you anymore. They start eating different foods than they ever ate before, or they start cooking for the family a lot and want you to eat it, but they don't want to eat it. <laughs> um, but mostly I would say with her withdrawal, extreme withdrawal, fatigue, you could just see stress in her body. Was she anorexic, bulimic? She was both. anorexic, and so okay. she got very, very thin eventually. And, and so, what, it, so it was evident after a couple of months. At what point then did you finally get the clue? Because sometimes parents yeah. don't get the clue at all. Well, I got, we got the clue within the family because the family dynamics started getting rocky too because we just couldn't figure out why the communication was different. But I think we between really mom knew and daughter or just mom between mom, else? mom and daughter and sisters. I mean, it just wasn't right. She just wasn't her happy. We always used to call her a ping pong child, and she she just was such. She was she was always the connector in the family, and, and that wasn't going on anymore. I think we really realized that that summer when she couldn't pull her body out of the water one day to go water skiing, and I just took her aside and I said, "Why do you think you can't do that anymore? What's what's going on with you?" And also, we noticed how extremely thin she was when we saw her in. in ski attire, water skiing attire. Well, l let's talk here about uh, that your family's finding out <laughs> now, and Annie, in your case, is revealed in the documentary, um, you hid this for four years from your parents, and they had no clue. Your mother was totally shocked, and it wasn't until you, what, a, soror a sorority sister told her? Mm -hmm. How did you manage to do that? I don't know. I, I I remember being surprised at, at the, in the beginning how easy it was to hide it. Um, and when you were talking about hiding, what were you doing? Um, pin, pinpointed questions really don't get asked all that often, and so you don't ever have to flat out really lie about anything. It's always little things like, oh, I ate already, or I don't, I'm going somewhere else to have dinner. It, it's little, like, subversive sort of white lies, and, and that just becomes really easy to do. And if you have an understanding of how your parents process things, or how most people do, you not only cover up the little things, but you cover up more obscure kind of peripheral things that you think might lead them to the conclusion that you might have an eating disorder. And you can figure out what those are, and you can kind of spearhead other people from finding out. Well, let's put it this way. You were a heck of a manipulator, <laughs> weren't you? I mean, let's face it. <laughs> yes, and... So, um, okay, were you hiding? Were you anorexic and bulimic? Or? Yes, I was both. Okay. And the documentary portrays me as being a bulimic, but through that whole time, I was also severely restrictive, and there were times when... I was just plain anorexic, and I didn't eat, and I would lose weight, but I never got down to the point where it was noticeable because Amara, of that. Tomorrow was your family? I mean, this, for you, you, you were, um, Annie, were what, 14? When I started, yeah. Okay, and, and you were younger. I was nine. Um, I, I think it's, it's dangerous and, and perhaps unkind to families to suggest that there's some sort of Houdini-esque thing going on where we, whereby people with eating disorders trick these oblivious, bumbling well, parents. I'm not you know. putting it that way. I'm no, saying that there was secretive. I don't secretive. think you are. I think I'm, it's I'm easy it's for, um, I think every parent looks at another parent who, say, misses a colossal eating disorder in their midst and says, how could you do that? I would never miss that. But you would. I think most parents would because, like you say, you aren't asking that question. It's very rare that you will say to your 10 or 11 or 12-year-old, uh, do, you, do you have bulimia? <laughs> you know, I mean, you don't say that. You, you feel that something is wrong, but you don't know what it is. One of the most instructive things that my mom ever said to me about, you know, how could you possibly not know, I said, she said, you just keep stretching the boundaries of normal mm -hmm. out further and further and further, and that's understandable, especially in a phase like adolescence. Um, and then once somebody's out of the house, once you're an adult, uh, hiding it becomes no longer an issue. So, uh, Pat Fallon, this, their behavior is very typical, mm -hmm. very common. I think it's, I think it, it, there, those behaviors are really common, but again, they're sort of a spectrum. I think for some, some families find out very quickly, and other, in other families it can go on for a long time, and that can be because I like that idea of stretching the boundaries of what's normal. I mean, what's normal is what it happens in your family, so it's not like you have a, something to compare it to. So 
Um, so in some families, I think it can go on for a very long time, and in other families, it goes on um, not so. Is this very okay? Quick. One thing I want to know is this: it seems to me that there are a lot of factors in this, mm -hmm. um, and it's not just one thing. I mean, oftentimes we hear these days it's the images that young women see, and obviously, I think they probably pay. Uh, it plays some part into it, you know, the, the fact that there's such a, a emphasis on being thin or the images you see on, on the cover of a magazine, that type of thing. But there's so much more that goes into this. Is it genetic? Is it social behavior? Is it <laughs> That's what researchers what? have been trying to answer that question for, <laughs> for the last 20 years. I, I, I think that, that um, the best way that we can describe that is that there's a, a constellation of factors that come together and, and when sort of the right building blocks come together, so to speak, then an eating disorder emerges from that. And those building blocks can be things like our culture, but we know Every woman, or many, many women, are, are um, see the images of, of thin women and glamorous women, and not all women that see those images develop eating disorders. They're, they, in and of themselves, they don't do that. But we do know that Western cultures um, are have higher rates of eating disorders. We know that families in which um, that don't communicate well can sometimes have difficulties be part of the eating disorder too. But there's lots of families that don't communicate very well that, whose kids don't end up with an eating disorder. Genetics, um, I think, is one of the more uh, newer and more interesting pieces of the puzzle and when it comes to eating disorder. And it, and it may be that certain things like uh, that are genetically determined, such as temperament, um, obsessiveness, perfectionism, traits like that. So you're, you're may still trying. To to it. I mean, so you're still trying to kind of. It doesn't mean that we can't. We don't know how to treat it. We, I think. But we really, have a it's only been in the last 20 years that this is uh, determining what anorexia and bulimia Certainly is, determining has come, what bulimia come about. Is. Mm -hmm. Now, the two of you came from high-achieving families. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, your your father's a lawyer. Your mother has a degree, a couple of degrees. Your parents very successful. How, what kind of impact did that have on this? The, it, was there a sense of this perfection you needed to have, or the, did it play a role? Uh, it, to, to speak for my own family, my, my parents never honestly pushed me. I mean, I saw friends whose parents literally pushed them to do certain things. I think it was the example of my parents that I myself, and this is my temperament and my character that I came with, felt inadequate, felt very, I needed to measure up um, and, and that's, like you say, Pat, a constellation of my temperament and personality, the family that I grew up in, which was really all about success, um, and that was just a fact of the family, and the, the time that I grew up in. I grew up, I was born in the 70s, and I grew up in the 80s, this sort of boom of needing to look, appear, acquire. I mean, I think the cultural dynamic does mm -hmm. play a role in all of this as well, and I think it does not cause it, but it does play a role. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I, I would agree with Maria in that I, I don't remember being pushed horribly by my parents either. I remember wanting a lot of things and wanting to be a lot of things. And there might have been individual cases where, you know, my parents played a larger role, but it, they didn't make me into who I was. I mean, I... What do you think made you fall into this? Oh, God, I don't... I don't even know. I mean, it, there's just so there's many a things. For the ages, isn't <laughs> I know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like, have, if ahead. I if I had been a different person in my family, I might have turned out fine, and I might have not had ever had depression or an eating disorder or anything. And had I been raised in a different family, I might have turned out okay too. It was just, it's a hook and an eye. You know, you can be who you are in a situation that's fine for you, or you can. It just it it's. It is. It's just a, such a combination of things. I don't think you can talk to anyone with an eating disorder, and they'll be I'm able to tell you exactly what uh, Virginia Lowe, talk about the family situation in this. You work with families. Mm -hmm. You created this organization with uh, the emphasis on, on providing support, I take it. For the family. What, what do you mm -hmm. see? That, that the well, one thing I wanted on to family. say that I do see is that, and I can just start with my own family. I have three children very close together. And we have families that come to our support group Monday night after Monday night. And you can have a huge family, you can have a small family, and only one child usually gets sick with the eating disorder, and they were all within that family. Mm -hmm. And so what we tell families from our own experience, and, and this is from personal experience, I think everybody comes to, the, to an eating disorder with a little bit different recipe box of all these combinations that Pat talked with. And the important thing is everybody's going to get different in um, get healthy in a different way. People come to our support group and they, they are hoping we're going to have that, that prescription, that they can go to the drugstore and they can buy that. Uh -huh. And that's just not going to happen. And, and in fact, that <laughs> happened and it was very evident in the documentary in your situation where 
you came back after being in treatment, and I think your mother expected things to be, you're going to be okay, but mm -hmm. you weren't. Mm -hmm. And it was a shock, wasn't it? Yeah. It takes, it takes a long, a long, long time. And, and, it, and it, it takes some redefining of what you think about yourself, and it takes mm -hmm. a few relapses so that you remember why you don't want to have an eating disorder, because <laughs> it sucks. And um, it just, yeah, it takes a long time. You're never going to emerge from anything fine. It's a process. Yeah. It's, it is a recovery, I think, for people is a process. Um, let's talk, uh, several things I want to talk about here in the short amount of time that we have left. Um, this is very fascinating, and, and I think it's so important, too. But treatment. In this state, there is no, uh, as was mentioned in the documentary, the, the last treatment facility in the state, which was here in Seattle at uh, Ballard Swedish, closed down. So mm -hmm. there's no treatment facility here. There's no inpatient treatment facility and in the state of Washington. So it means not, not everyone is going to need an inpatient Mm -hmm. uh, treatment facility like both of you had. You know, in some cases, they can't. You can have success in individual treatment, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. But the cost. It seems like in Suni's case, the, her family. You know, what eighty-three thousand mm -hmm. dollars? I mean, it, this was a huge amount of money. It could. I think it could break a family, couldn't it? Well, it certainly mm -hmm. could. I mean, the cost of families, I think, can be excruciating. And uh, I think it's one of the best. Um, arguments for having early detection if you begin to be worried about your child. If anybody comes up to you and says, you know, their friends, their sorority sisters, whatever, comes up and say something, you really need to pay attention to that because the longer it goes on, the more um, physically impaired somebody gets, the more intervention you're going to need. And um, so, no, I think there's, there, yes, we've, there are no more uh, inpatient treatment facilities here, but the idea is that people need access to good treatment. That could be individual treatment, group treatment, family treatment, more intensive outpatient treatment, in inpatient treatment. And what about insurances? Do they cover this? Or is that a constant depends, battle? Dep it's a constant battle. It depends on what the insurance companies are. are you um, say when I was at the, my treatment program, the insurance company paid for it in the beginning, and they would approve one day at a time. And the lady in charge of that um, had to call them every single day for them to approve another day. Mm -hmm. I mean, as if something really significant was going to happen in one day. You know, I wasn't going to need to be there anymore, but they're very, very stingy usually with their allowing you to, or paying for your treatment. Which makes it very difficult to have any sort of treatment, r reasonable treatment plan if you don't know if the person's going to be there the next day. Uh, Virginia and maybe Pat, you can mm -hmm. also talk about this a little bit too. Um, let's talk about hope and success. Is, mm -hmm. is, what kind of success, what kind of hope is there. I think our parent support group offers a lot of hope because we always have a group of parents whose children have recovered and then we get a new group of people who come in totally um, anxious, full of anxiety, full of fear, full of misunderstandings about eating disorders. And then we have people that come in and stay for two or three years. They come faithfully every Monday night and their daughters were very sick when they came but they're finally starting to mm -hmm. get to that recovery process. Pat very gently spoke about recovery as a process. And that's really our philosophy in the eating disorder support group for, for parents is to help parents learn that it's not an event. It's not going to happen when Annie got out after how many weeks she was there. But it is a long process. And we try and really help parents have hope, number one, that their daughters will recover. And we try and offer them support to understand eating disorders. And we try and allow them to have a place where they can also vent. Parents get, get very angry about this sure. disease. It it's makes them very, very, very angry. And so it's really nice to have a place that they can come that's safe for them also to vent that anger and then to start learning from one another from hearing other parents' stories. Pat, what would you say about hope and success? Oh, well, I would say the reason I like to work with eating disorders is cause, because it's I fun. believe people can get better from it. And, and um, yes, they need r access to good treatment. They need some resources to be able to do that. And they need a willingness to look some pretty difficult issues in the eye. But mm -hmm. if they do that, they can get better. Quickly, uh, Maria and uh, Annie, uh, we have less than a minute here. Um, your future now. I mean, are you over this? Are you beyond it? Or is there a chance it'll come you back? You know, the gun's always on the table. I can always pick it up. There's no need to. Uh, I had no idea how long it would take, the process. Um, and I had no idea how good it would get without it. I just had no idea how good it would so get. So you're that yeah. example of hope and success. Yeah. To myself. Yeah. yeah. And well, yeah, that's, that's where it counts the most. And Annie, what about yourself? I know that you say you're still struggling, you're still dealing with it. The future? I'm still trying. I, I still think I'm at that point where it's hard for me to picture myself as recovered in the past tense. Mm -hmm. It's all over now, I'm fine, it's all in the past. And I, I, I think it's, that's really hard for me to believe still. 
I can get, I can picture myself being happy enough to not want to really have an eating disorder or to not obsess about it too much, but still kind of semi, semi still this way, maybe a little improved, but it is hard to imagine my life without it. It's been a part of it for so long that it's, it's hard for me to believe in, in total recoveredness. Well, I hope you find it. Thank you. And I thank you all for taking the time and to share your stories. I really appreciate it. Well, we'd like to uh, thank you for joining us for this KCTS Connect Special Edition. We invite you to go to the KCTS website at kcts.org where you'll find streaming video with additional interview clips from the KCTS documentary, Perfect Illusions. You'll also find a list of resources about eating disorders. Thank you again for joining us. Thank you all for being here and sharing your stories and taking the time. I'm Enrique Suna. Good night. Local production of KCTS Connects is made possible in part by the members of KCTS and by Seattle Public Utilities, thanking businesses and residents throughout the Puget Sound for their water conservation efforts. Working together, we can solve our regional water resource needs for now and the future. And by the Seattle Post-Intelligencer.